here on the uh, 30th of October. We were going to have a hot blessed meal, but we're going to do that uh, uh, November 4th. Uh, the women's ministry from Teen Challenge is going to come down and they're going to sing some songs and they're going to do some, have some testimonies. Uh, Teen Challenge is an awesome ministry that it's a rehabilitation ministry and uh, so we're going to hear some great testimonies of what God's doing and, and uh, the lives there uh, with Teen Challenge. So that'll be November 4th and uh, we'll have a, a meal afterwards for them, a bus meal for the church also. Um, I want to show you just a promo of the Thursday night Bible study because I really hate for anybody to miss this. It's really good. Uh, it's James McDonald doing a, a series on, on the vertical church. And uh, I'm just going to show this promo for you. The other day I had on my desk 30 recent books written about the Church of Jesus Christ. One word describes them all horizontal. How to understand your audience, how to impact the people around you, how to influence them, how to win them, how to assimilate them, what they need, what they want, what we think, what they think. Forget it. Here's a word you need to have at the forefront of your thinking. The word is vertical. Somehow we've lost this in the church. The idea that the church is supposed to be about horizontal, man-centered, human persuasion, cultural penetration, nonsense. Before the purpose of the church was ever so teriological, it was doxological. Ephesians 3.20 says, To him be glory in the church through Jesus Christ now and forevermore. Everything we do has to resound with the fame of the name of God's Son. When that happens, everything else falls into place. Evangelism, discipleship, community impact, ministries of compassion, these things are byproducts of a church that is passionately consumed with the glory of God. It's a concept that you need to have at the forefront of your thinking about the work of the Church of Jesus Christ. Vertical. That's Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. Um, and there is a workbook also. Uh, I think we have two workbooks left, but we can't order more. Well, last week, uh, I might remember what I preached on last week. Two people, that's great. Don't pay attention to It was on the power, it was on Philippians chapter 3. And it was on the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And uh, if you missed that message, or uh, I do have some CDs in the back. But in Philippians chapter 3, Paul refers to, uh, in the first three chapters, I just want to kind of go over a review, because uh, last week I talked about the fellowship of his suffering. And this week, uh, I I left you in the suffering part of it, but this week we're going to look at the power of the resurrection. And uh, so that's what we're going to do this week. But uh, Philippians chapter 3, Paul refers to three types of of fellowship in the first three chapters. Chapter 1, he talks about the fellowship of the gospel, which which is when we fellowship around God's word. And uh, just like on Thursday nights and and, uh, in the morning in our Bible study there, uh, how many enjoy just fellowshipping around God's word? And also Sunday mornings we talk about God's Word and preach God's Word. And, and then uh, Thursday nights we have a time of fellowshipping in God's Word. So that's awesome to, to fellowship and get revelation from the Lord uh, by His Spirit uh, into His Word. And, and then they, he talks about in chapter 2 the fellowship of His Spirit. And we all love the fellowship of His Spirit uh, being in the presence of God and feeling His anointing and, and uh, being encouraged and being blessed by the uh, power of God's Spirit as we come together and worship. And then in chapter 3, he talks about the fellowship of His suffering. How many love that? <laughs> well, uh, the fellowship of His suffering, we have a hard time with that. We, we like, I, I told you that we like painless dentists, painless workouts, painless diet plans. But Paul mentioned two powerful truths in this passage. He said the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And I said that most teachings in the church today fit in one or two of these camps. 
they're either all about the power of his resurrection and they don't, they don't teach much of the fellowship of his suffering, uh, but mostly all about resurrection and, and don't mention that, uh, you know, that things could happen, you know, that suffering does happen. And, uh, you know, in some camps that people are so uh, far over on the power of the resurrection that if you mention a cold, you know, you're out of faith. And uh, so I think you could classify all teaching within these two camps and the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. And, uh, but I think it's both. I, you know, Paul said that I might know him. How many want to know the Lord, Jesus? Uh, Paul said I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. And that's the full gospel. That's the whole gospel there. That's, it's not one or the other, but it's both. And if you look at Paul's life, he was, he was uh, you know, a good example of that because he was shipwrecked and uh, he was beaten and left for dead and, and uh, all kinds of things happened. And then on the other side, he moved in the power of the resurrection and, and the ministry of healing and all kinds of the things that we like to see. So Paul understood that it was both. It was the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. And I also said that there's those in the body of Christ who teach a balanced message, which is uh, understanding both of these truths. Uh, preachers like Chuck Swindoll and Jim Cimbala, Greg Laurie, Michael Youssef, James McDonnell, Charles Stanley, Joe Mancuso, and Bruce Henderson. <laughs> <clears throat> I put us up there with the big dogs. <laughs> but last week I left you in the fellowship of, of his suffering, but this week we're going to look at the other truth Paul mentioned, which was knowing him in the power of his resurrection. And we ended last week uh, with a passage out of the book of Job. And uh, Job said this in chapter 19, 25. You know, he couldn't understand why everything that happened to him. He, he, he had that question, why? And, and then he had three people who were trying to tell him why, who were just, you know, turned out to be very not uh, encouraging, but very discouraging. And so Job says this. He said, I cannot answer you uh, cannot answer all your questions, and I cannot defend myself against your accusations and your argu arguments, and I cannot justify myself in your eyes. He said, but I know this, but I know this. I, and he said, what he's saying is, I, I think this, I believe uh, this, and I, and I know it. He said, I know this with certainty without a hint of doubt or disbelief, but certain assurance uh, that will be spoken in eternal truth. So, so Job was certain about this one thing, even though he didn't understand everything else that was going on in his life, he was certain about this one thing that he's getting ready to talk about. He said that in the midst of despair, in the midst of loss, in the midst of, of personal pain and suffering, Job speaks this one thing of assurance uh, Job looks not at the past or at the present, but he looks at, to the future and confidently he states this. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. I don't understand all this and, and uh, you know, but he said, one thing I know for sure, that my Redeemer lives. Martin Luther said, we must accept finite disappointments, but never lose infinite hope. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Job had this lively hope, this this. Uh, I know that my Redeemer lives and something is going to happen out of all this. Job said, my Redeemer lives. We sing that song, my Redeemer lives. I know he rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sins. I believe. 
<laughs> and then we sing, my Redeemer lives. What does it mean to be redeemed or to say like Job, uh, I know that my Redeemer lives? My first understanding of this word uh, came when I was just a boy, and I remember my mom connect, uh, collecting s &H stamps and Eagle stamps. I may remember... You're really dating yourself now. <laughs> and uh, she would fill those things up. And, and when she had enough of them, she'd take them to the redemption center. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that she was redeeming something and getting something better for it. And uh, the, defin of, the definition of the word is to buy or to buy out or to pay a ransom for. And there are three different words in the Hebrew to describe the idea of redemption. The first term is used for redemption has a legal meaning. The verb is pada. And it's used when an animal substitute for a person or for an, or an animal. Under the Hebrew law, when a person or animal needs to be redeemed, the substitution must be made or the price paid Otherwise, the creature involved lost its life. There's, a, uh, there's also the word gael, which is used uh, to discuss family rules and obligation and laws over family property. For example, if a person or property was lost by a family member, the next of kin had a right and obligation to redeem that property. Uh, this protected the family inheritance. The person who bought back the property was the goel, or the redeemer. Also, if an Israelite was forced to sell himself into slavery to pay his debt, he could be redeemed by a near relative. And uh, the third term in the Hebrew is the word kafar, which means to cover, or the price paid to cover our sins. That's what the word redeem means. And in the Old Testament, we have shadows and types of Christ. Uh, and you find these being fulfilled, these old, uh, old uh, shadows and types in the Old Testament, they all talked about Christ and, and the true Redeemer. And, uh, but Jesus, he is the, the pada, the price paid. He died in our behalf so we can be so we can live he is the goel the redeemer that buys back that which was lost he is the only one that paid the price and took away our sin john the baptist described jesus as the fulfillment of god's redemptive work in matthew 20:28 20, it says the son of man came, came to give himself as a ransom for many galatians 13 3:13 says christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. And you know, I think that the greatest work on the cross was our redemptive work, that we were bought back from the fall. When, when Adam and Eve fell, the Bible says because of one man's sin, many became sinners. And so death passed upon all men, and all became sinners, and we are all born under that sinful nature. And, but right there in the, in the book of Job, God made a promise. He said uh, that I'm going to raise up one whose heel is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And he was talking about Christ. He's, I'm going to raise up one who's going who's to bruise the head of the devil. And uh, there might have been a, a battle lost, but God was going to win the war. And right there in the, in the, in the fall, God prophesied about the Redeemer, the one who is going to buy back and, and pay for what was lost in the fall. And so when Christ came he, and died on the cross and, and rose from the dead, he redeemed us. He made it possible for us to be bought back in our rightful place uh, in relationship with him. But when, when man fell, he was separated from God. And uh, he couldn't restore that relationship 
uh, they had types of, of offerings that would cover their sin. But when Jesus Christ died and, and came, he was the true redeemer and he bought us back and he has redeemed us from, from the fall and now we're made right. That's why we can have his righteousness and we can have fellowship with him, with God, once again, the way that we were created in the beginning. That's the redemptive work. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgression and as a cloud of your sins. Colossians 2, 14 says, Blotting out the handwritings and ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So if, if you're saved this morning, if you've been redeemed then all your sins have been blotted out and you've been forgiven and your past is gone and, and you're a new creature in Christ and, and God looks at you as a new creature, as a new creation and, and your old has passed away and, and you've been redeemed. Now you've been, you belong to him. So the Old Testament was shadows and types of the real redeemer to come. They were redeemed by animal sacrifices and gold. And in Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter, it talks about all the great women of faith like Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. But it said these all died in faith, not having yet received the promise. But seeing them afar off were persuaded by them and embraced them and in confess plainly that they seek another country. So the Old Testament saints, they, they saw this by faith. And the Bible says that they died in faith, not having yet received the promise, but seeing them afar off were persuaded of them and embraced them. And, you know, when Christ rose from the dead, there was people seen walking in the streets. When, when the Old Testament saints died, they went to a place called Abraham's bosom. And when Jesus died and rose, then that was the final payment for redemption. And these Old Testament saints were redeemed. They lived under shadows and types, but when Jesus Christ died and, and he rose, he was redeemed. They were redeemed uh, by the blood of the Lamb and by the resurrection of Christ. 1 Peter 1.18 says, For as much as you know that you were not re redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold from your vain conversation or your lifestyle, received by their traditions from your fathers. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And in Hebrews chapter 11, that great faith chapter, it talks about all the great men and women of faith like Enoch, uh, Sarah, but it also says they all died in faith, not having received the promise, but seeing they were far off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them. So redemption, the true redemption was paid for by the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what Job was saying is that God will take this mess. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. And what Job was saying, that God is going to take this mess and redeem it and turn my mess into a message or turn my test into a testimony. In the book of James, he mentions the redemption of Job. He said, consider the patience of Job, how he saw the end of the Lord. Job stood in faith because he knew that his Redeemer lives, because his Redeemer lives. And in Job 42, 10 through 12, it talks about how God turned Job's test into a testimony. How, he got, how God turned things around, how God took this mess 
and made a message out of it. It says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord also gave Job twice as much as he had. You know, it's amazing that, that when God spoke to these three friends of his that were counseling Job, that he told them, he says, Now you've got to go ask Job for prayer. Which was really, uh, God was humbling them because they thought that they were so spiritual they knew exactly what was wrong with Job. And uh, so they had to hum humble themselves and, and go ask Job for prayer. And, and I'm sure Job had to forgive them. So there was something going on there when God told him that. Uh, he says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all them that have been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in the house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil uh, that had br been brought upon him. And every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginnings. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels, and a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. So God took that mess that Job was in and redeemed it. You know, the Bible says in, in Joel, it says that I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten, and the canker worm, and the palmer worm. I mean, when the locusts come through, they eat quite a bit. But then you've got the locust and the palmer worm and, and they're following and there's just totally nothing left. And sometimes that's the way our life is. You know, the devil comes in and he just, he just destroys everything that's good in our life and, and, and just brings us down to barrenness. Totally nothing. But God says that I will restore, I will redeem the years that the devil has taken from you. And, and that was the scripture when I first got saved, that I was a total mess. And I, I was uh, into drugs. I didn't have a penny to my name. I was, I was a hippie. I got out of jail. Uh, and, and I didn't have a thing. And God, my mind was a mess. And God took me, took me, my mess and when I gave my life to him in the front seat of a Chevy by an ex-heroin addict the Lord start redeeming my life he said I'm buying you back Joe I've, I've paid the price for you and I'm not going to let the devil have you since you've accepted me and asked me into your life I paid the price for you you're mine now I've redeemed you I bought you you belong to me. And God start redeeming me. I start getting gas in my tank. <laughs> I was able to buy some food. <laughs> and <clears throat> he, he start giving me a sound mind and, and thinking and, and start growing in God's word. And then he revealed his plan for my life and I start serving him. And God has been restoring me now for 30 years. It's just like those old cars, you know, you, you'll find these guys who go out and buy these old 39 Chevys and they're nothing but rust and, and, and junk. I saw one the other day, a guy had a, a 52 Chevy on the back of a trailer. It was covered in rust. Headlights hanging down, the interior all over the place. But he'll take that thing in there and he'll sand it down and, and go into that thing and every detail, he'll restore it the way it was originally came out of the showroom. And when that man rolls it out, he, it's been redeemed and restored. Amen. And you see, that's the way we are when God brings us in. He buys us back from all the devastation of the fall. We're all rusted out. 
our headliners are falling down, our headlights are, are hanging off, and our dashboards are all messed up, and God starts sanding on us. And we don't like it, but he's, he's doing something. He's restoring us. He's redeeming us. And when, he, when, he, when it's done, we're going to come out bearing the glory of God and the restoration work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I see a car that's restorated, you know, that's been restored, I, I'm just amazed at it. You know, there's a scripture in Colossians. Colossians chapter uh, 3, I believe it's, it is, that it says that, um, it says, let me think about it first. I, I, I had it and it gone. <laughs> that when Christ shall appear, when Christ shall appear, we also shall appear with him in glory. And you know, I used to think that means well, when Christ comes back, we're going to appear with him in glory. But I checked the commentaries, and none of them say that. And I think what it really means when Christ begins to appear in our lives, that we appear with him in glory. That when, when we get rolled out of the showroom, and people see that our lives have been restored by the power of, of the gospel, then people give God the glory. Amen. So that's what Job was talking about. And, and sometimes we don't understand all the things that we go through and why they happen. But one thing we could say for sure is my Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. Like Job said. And then it says after this, Job lived 140 years. I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> I'm feeling rough at 62. <laughs> and saw his sons and his son's sons, even four generations. So Job died being an old man and full of days. You know, this is throughout the Old Testament. It's, it's types and shadows of what Christ is going to do in his church. And he redeemed Job. He, he bought back this horrible situation, this mess, and he redeemed him. If you look at the life of Joseph in Genesis, his brothers threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. That's dysfunction. That's family dysfunction, isn't it? I mean, they were very jealous of him. How would you like your siblings to take you and throw you in a pit and then sell you to slavery that's what happened I mean that had to hurt his feelings so they threw him in the pit and sold him into slavery uh, then a man bought him named Potiphar and then Potiphar he was thrown into prison because of being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and uh but God redeemed him. God redeemed him. I mean, you know, we read that story so fast. You know, uh, the situation with Potiphar. I mean, and then we, we see Joseph in jail and he spent time in jail and, and God blessed him in jail. But can you imagine the thoughts that run through your mind when you're falsely imprisoned for something you didn't do? And so Joseph was in jail, and, 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 uh, and he was falsely accused. And God turned that thing around. God began to redeem him and turn that test into a testimony. Joseph was made a ruler and saved the whole nation of Egypt from famine. And not only that, his family also. But I'm sure when Job was in the pit, I mean, all kinds of things was, could have been going through his mind. Why is this happening to me, God? And then, you know, it, it wasn't just one bad day. Then he gets sold into slavery. And then he gets falsely accused and thrown into jail. 
And if you remember, he had this great vision of all his brothers bowing down and serving him. And man, he was thinking probably, where where's the vision go? Job was, I mean, Joseph was in a mess. He was in a test. But God began to redeem him and turned his test into a testimony. And Joseph was made a ruler. One more uh, example of this is in Daniel chapter 9. Oh, I'm sorry. It's in Daniel. I don't know what chapter. I didn't have it, write it down. I think it is 9. But uh, it's about King Nebuchadnezzar. He told everybody he made this image of gold 90 foot tall and 9 foot wide. That's a big statue. And he invites eight levels of government. Then tells everyone that when the music was played, that they were to bow down and worship this golden image. And if you didn't, you would be thrown into a fiery furnace and it became a law. Now, I mean, think about that. If, if uh, our president would happen to say, okay, I'm going to make this big statue and, uh, and we're going to have uh, this marching band play this music and everybody is supposed to bow down and worship this thing and if you don't, uh, you're going to be thrown into the gas chamber. Think about that. And, and they said, when the king questioned them why they didn't, they said, we don't take this matter lightly. I mean, you, you said we're going to get thrown into the fiery furnace. That's, that's rough. And so there's three men, and we all know who they were, that didn't bow down to this statue, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And God redeemed them, though. He turned their test into a testimony. And right in the middle of the furnace, God was with them. You know, the, he said, didn't we throw three of them in there, but there's a fourth man. He said, one like unto the Son of Man. So God was right there in the furnace with them. And even though we don't understand the furnace, God's in the furnace with us. And he's going to go through it with us. And God redeemed that situation. What was once a law, because the king made it a law that if anyone uh, didn't bow down to this idol and served other gods, they would be thrown into the fire furnace. But now the king takes and, and makes a law that if anyone doesn't serve the God of Israel, uh, they're going to be punished. So isn't that something? God turned that whole thing around. It was once uh, the law that you couldn't serve the God of Israel, but now because God delivered these three men and uh, from the fiery furnace, this king recognized that their God was the true God. And he turned their test into a testimony. And the whole nation was told that they were to serve the God of Israel. Isaiah 43, 1 says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, for thou art mine. Repeat that after me. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, for thou art mine. I've redeemed thee. You're, you belong to God. Now look what he says because of that. That when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers... They shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flames kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, 
the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. How many believe that passage? You know, I was at Country Mart the other day, and, and uh, somebody come up to me, and they, they just, you know, they were more nosy than they were concerned. How I many could tell when somebody's just nosy instead of being concerned? And, you know, they, I mean, they followed me all the way to the car. And uh, they said, you know, I heard Pastor Bruce is sick and dying, you know. After all this, and, and they wanted all the information on Carol. You know. <laughs> what well, was so funny? I didn't hear that. No. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I, I just about had enough. And I just turned to her and I said, No, I'm sorry, but Pastor Bruce is healed. And God healed him. And, and, uh, and she looked at me and she goes, Oh. <laughs> and walked away. And I know my Redeemer lives. Hallelujah. I know my Redeemer lives. I don't understand it, but I know my Redeemer lives. And, and that's what's going on throughout, throughout Genesis to Revelation. God proved himself to be our true Redeemer. And, and the greatest redemptive work of all is that he's redeemed us from the fall and he's brought us back unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled that's reserved in heaven for you. Amen. That's redemption. If I don't get everything here, I've got an inheritance waiting for me in heaven. Aren't you glad that you're redeemed this morning? That you've been bought back by the precious blood of Christ. You're no more under the curse of the fall. The Bible says that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. The greatest work of all is being redeemed from your sins. The Bible says in Ephesians that at times you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Isaiah 44, 22 says... I've blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. In Isaiah 51, verse 11. Oh, I turned off the thing. Uh, I was going to have you put that up there. Uh, turn to Isaiah 51, 11. How many write in their Bible? The rest of you ought to try it sometime. <laughs> I've got it on here, so I just highlight it. <laughs> Isaiah 51 11. If you don't have this verse marked down in your Bible, I would encourage you to mark it down. Underline it. Memorize it. It says, therefore, the, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. An everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Isn't that awesome scripture? I'm going to teach you how to sing that because... I learned that by a song. And it just simply goes like this. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. 
and come with sing. Read it, read it, and we'll sing it. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. An everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. An everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. You sing that two or three times a day, that'll bless you. Praise God. Do you know that your Redeemer lives? Praise God. You know, you might have situations right now that you need God to redeem you from. You, you might be living in a mess right now. And you continue living in that mess because you don't think that it's ever going to get straightened out. But God wants to redeem your situation. He wants to prove himself to you that he is the great redeemer. And I want us to close in prayer. And if you have a mess that you're living in right now, or maybe you've never made Christ your redeemer, maybe you've never accepted him and said, Lord, come into my life and purchase me back that I could see your redemptive work begin in my life as you begin to restore me and rebuild me in the way you've created me. But if you have a mess that you're dealing with right now, just give it to the Lord. The Bible says, cast your care upon him because he cares for you. You might not understand the mess. You might not get it, why it's happening, where it came from, but just commit it unto him. Cast it unto him and confess that my Redeemer lives. Lord, we come to you this morning because you're the, the Redeemer. You are the one who bought back all that was lost by the fall. You purchased it with your blood. Everything, every, every sin, every mess up, God, you paid the price for it. Lord, maybe there's some out there that are struggling because of past failures in their life. Maybe a failed relationship, a failed financial deal, or, or, or something, God, that they just have never been able to get over. But you're the great redeemer, Lord. You could redeem a, a bad situation, God, and, and you could forgive uh, sin this morning and, and because you've paid the price for it, Lord. So, Father, we commit all these things into your hand. We cast our care upon you because you care for us. And we just ask that you would begin to redeem us and that you would be with us as we walk through the fire and through the rivers and through the waters. In Jesus' name.